Welcome, welcome, welcome to the living room where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Make yourself right at home. I'm glad you're here. I'm excited to welcome our special guest to the living room today. And before I met him personally, his reputation had already gone before him. I had the opportunity to walk in his footsteps at Pine Forge Academy and Oakwood University, formerly Oakwood College, and his leadership acumen was already budding even as a teenager. Dr. Sidney Freeman is an associate professor of adult organizational learning and leadership at the University of Idaho. He is a former National Home Scholar and has earned professional certifications in the areas of faculty development, online instruction, executive management, and organizational leadership. His research investigates the future of minority serving institutions, the faculty career cycle, and higher education as a field of study. Dr. Freeman has published numerous journal articles and is the lead editor of the 2014 publication, publication excuse me, Advancing Higher Education as a Field of Study in Quest of Doctoral Degree Guidelines. This publication received the 2015 Auburn University Graduate School Book of the Year Award. He also serves on the board of directors of the American Association of University Administrators and was honored as the 2015 Emergent Leader of the Year by this same professional society. This was based on his leadership at Tuskegee University in his previous capacity as director of one of Tuskegee's teaching and learning centers. He serves on multiple academic journal editorial and review boards and is the founder and editor in chief of the Journal for the Study of Post Secondary and Tertiary Education. Dr. Freeman and I have had wonderful off the record conversations. And so you're in for a treat as we have a conversation on the record. Please welcome educator, administrator, and scholar, thought leader, one of my friends and brothers, Dr. Sidney Freeman. What's going on, brother? Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on your platform. Listen, I, it's been said before, and it is true in this instance, the early bird gets the worm. For those of you <laughs> who are watching this, you will probably be watching this uh, around noon Eastern Standard Time if you are catching it when it first launches. Uh, and afterwards, I don't know when you're watching it, but I want to let you in on a little secret. We are up relatively early. Uh, this brother believes in going to sleep early, getting up early, getting stuff done. <laughs> so uh, it's good to have you here this morning, man. Uh, yeah. Like I said in your introduction, before I met you personally, I went to school with your younger brother at mm -hmm. Pine Forge. And when I arrived at Oakwood, uh, it was college when I arrived and halfway through my freshman year, uh, they adopted and implemented the name Oakwood University. But I mm -hmm. saw your name upstairs in the library. Uh. <laughs> I, I went to school with Sidney Freeman's brother. What is this about? We'll get to that a little mm -hmm. later. But man, it's great to see what you are doing, what your family is doing. Um, and I'm excited just to not only kind of discuss your journey thus far in life and in work. Um, so let's begin there at the beginning, man. Yeah. Where are you from originally? I'm from a, a city called Camden, New Jersey. And uh, I like to say I'm a son of my Olivet Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, I actually... I actually grew up in a town called Pensacola, which is a, a little small town adjacent to Camden. And so that was where I was from, where okay. I am from. New Jersey, right. Uh, Mount, Mount Olivet is actually, um, has played an integral part in my own professional ministerial development as a student wow. at Pine Forge, when Pastor Frank Leggett was pastoring there, <laughs> uh, he was one of, honestly, the first pastors to extend an opportunity for me to come. And as a young teenage, you know, boy preacher, as it were, I kind of cut my teeth, uh, try to preach, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so um, fond memories there. Definitely shout yeah. out to Mount Olivet, a rich, rich history in New Jersey. I'm a Florida boy. I have family okay. uh, from New Jersey. We would go up there and uh, visit. So that's as about a close, as close of my familiarity with New Jersey, with New Jersey growing up. What was life like growing up in Camden, New Jersey? Yes. Yeah, so I, I would say that a lot of my time 
uh, in New Jersey. I'm pre, pre-K through Oakwood uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christian education and primarily in Black, uh, Black Adventist education. However, from pre-K through f- uh, fourth grade, I attended a school called Prescott Seventh-day Adventist School, okay. uh, which was in a town called Cherry Hill. Uh, the in my fifth grade year I had my one year that I I attended public school that didn't work out too well. Uh, <laughs> so I came from an environment that was a family oriented environment. We mm-hmm. had about thirty five students, a two or three uh, classroom school within a uh, within a church to kind of yeah. use the fellowship hall and other spaces within the church to uh, have classes, uh, but. So when you went to public school, you couldn't talk junk and can't fight, (laughs) right? You got it. You got it. So, so, but I actually did pretty well, um, even though it was, even though it was a a challenging transition, I was all state band and all that had a chance to sing and all those Mm. kinds of things. So, so from that standpoint, it was a broader platform, but socially it was a hard adjustment going from a seventh day Adventist environment Mm -hmm. and then going into a public public school environment. From there though, I went to, I went to uh, Trenton Mount Sinai uh, uh, seventh day Adventist school, which is about an hour away. So each day we would travel an an hour to get to a school, but it was a black seventh day Adventist school. So that was cool. And then I went to uh, Pine Forge uh, academy for my high school years. So one of the things about going to Pine Forge is that it's a boarding academy in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a part of the rich legacy and history of the institution was that it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Right. And so, uh, but during that time, so during that time, that was between my my between the ages of fourteen and and eighteen. So I've been away from home since I was 14. So it kind of grew me up. So we love to say at Pine Forge, uh, it's a big thing if you were there for four years, three years, two years, one years. So I'm a four year senior, which is a major thing. I have, we even have sweaters that have the number of years that are on mm-hmm. on uh, our, our, our uh, sweaters as we graduate. And so, uh, so I had a good time, a good time growing up. And uh, after that went to to Oakwood University. I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go along. Most definitely. I didn't realize, I went to Pine Forge for my final two years of high school. And I didn't realize, I mean, yes, you're right. Four, three, two, one, all carry different meanings of significance. But when I arrived and when I was matriculating, I didn't realize just how young four year seniors were when they (laughs) arrived at Pine Forge. When I met them in my class, that is, we were juniors. So I just processed it like that. But right. a little older now, I say, man, many of them were 13, some on the young end, depending on when their right, birthday right, was, right. when they started school, they were 13. Others were 14. And um, I know when I left Tampa to go to Pine Forge, my mom said, son, you know, this is this is your going away. You know, you're not coming back home. I said, mom, I'll be, I'll be home every break. She says, no, that's not what I mean. Um, this kind of is the launching point for you. It's a little bit earlier than most students that you'll meet in college. And I didn't even process that. It wasn't until, right. honestly, Sydney, it wasn't until maybe halfway through college that I said, yo, she was right. That was it. And so now looking back, you're right. It's a huge thing for a four-year senior to leave home at such an early age. And just much respect to not only your parents, my parents, and all parents who mm-hmm. invested money and really invested time um, yeah. to send us away that early. It is continuing to yield uh, great dividends. You Mm -hmm. post a lot about your mother and father on social media. Um, They have obviously played an integral role in your development. I want to know how, how, in your opinion, does their influence still shape you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. Uh, I would say uh, I'll start with my dad uh, from a uh, intellectual and kind of scholastic standpoint and even just just as I grow as a man, mm-hmm. uh, he's been a wonderful sounding a wonderful sounding board uh, as I have have developed as a man, and particularly as I have stepped on to a 
stepped up to have a more public facing yeah. um i've had more opportunities to be on tv and things like that so he's always giving me uh feedback and things like that uh he was uh, early on uh, presented me with opportunities to uh to attend conferences so for wow. instance i was at, at academic conferences when i was like in elementary or middle school and so those things weren't like new to me mm -hmm. um uh i had uh i had the opportunity it would be every tuesday night at a at around i think it was around eight o'clock uh ty tribbett ty tribbett the gospel artist uh was from camden new jersey and so uh we had a singing ministry uh, where, and we were known around the city of Camden and my dad would help to facilitate a, um, a gospel concert each year, uh, in, during the summer in one of the big local parks in Camden. And so at, at one of the times that we did that, we opened for Ty Tribbett. Ty Tribbett had just, um, had just, uh, was on the soundtrack for the prince of egypt album okay and yeah. so and so somebody wanted to connect me with him as a, as as a as a young person and growing and so he invited me to sit in on their sit in on their rehearsals so religiously every tuesday night i would go and this was around like my middle school time uh and so even into pine forge mm -hmm. uh when i would come back i would sit in on his rehearsal so i so i knew the song so i knew the song before the albums came out right 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 because right, right. i was <laughs> because i was because i was uh because i was there and i often say that my dad providing that kind of exposure allowed me to see excellence at mm -hmm. an early age so even though i wasn't a uh i didn't end up becoming a singer or a musician when I see when, when I'm talking about early getting up early, I saw Ty Tribbett uh, start rehearsal at eight and go until one in the morning. Wow. Right. Wow. And and when you see him dancing, I often say every move is actually choreographed. Mm. Mm. So so he would stop. He would stop. Uh, 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 I guess the, the choir if they weren't doing the weren't doing the moves right and things like that. So you would see excellence for from a young person. This wasn't I, I, before I would see it, you know, I, I think about someone that was a little bit older, uh, but but between that and then also um, also other, uh, my church environment was, was one that helped shape me. But going to my mother, uh, one of the things that's most profound at this moment is that when I hear my voice, I sound like my mom, particularly wow. when when I sing. So if you've ever heard us sing before, we have great harmony. And a part of that is I, I don't know, but at even it was like that when I was younger. But even more, I, I hear myself singing something and I hear my mother's voice. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, and it's always nice to have someone that's excited to hear you when you hear from you when you call. So, she's oh, yeah, that, she's that constant, that constant encouragement. Most definitely. So a long answer to a to a short and direct question. No, no, that's that's fine. I mean, it's it's virtually impossible to to fit your entire life's worth of receiving the benefit of their influence into a few moments. So take your time on that. And again, one of the I think legacies of just Black history in general, and one of the beauties is when, especially as young Black males, we can have the privilege of looking in the rearview mirror and seeing both of our parents in our lives. I once heard a phrase said like this. It says, the good news and the bad news are one and the same. You are mm -hmm. more like your parents than you may want to claim. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And I love the fact that in your story, you can see both, I'm sure, but the good is really penetrating throughout your own sojourn and the saga that is still developing in your life. Um, yeah. I've had the chance to meet both of your parents. Like I said, mm -hmm. went to school with your brother. Uh, you all look alike which is amazing. And so it comes as no surprise that you, that you sound alike. Uh, let's, let's move a little bit further on. Well, before we do that, you mentioned it, that your church had a wonderful influence on your life. Yeah. At the time of this recording, PBS just released the two-part Black Church series. 
And again, this is one of those things that I think for me has grown in terms of my appreciation for it as an adult, as I've moved away from my home center. I went to mm -hmm. a small church uh, in what was originally supposed to be kind of a project community um, in Tampa, Florida, Progress Village. Love, love, love my church upbringing. Mm -hmm. It's not my story. Um, I didn't have one of those. I hated church, you know, didn't want to go. Loved it. Was surrounded by church mothers, church fathers who were part of that village. Describe, if you will, just a little bit. You mentioned that your church was influential in your development. Um, in what ways? And it doesn't have to be chronologically in order, just yeah. kind of firing it off. Yeah, so I would just say that it gives you a platform for for leadership, right? And so it gave you opportunity to stand in front of the church and learn how to articulate yourself. Um, one of the things that, that I'm most humbled about was earlier this week, uh, one of the members from my church uh, called and asked if I could be there for what we call Sabbath school. Uh, yeah. Other denominations may call it Sunday school, but it's the same equivalent. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so when they finally got up with me, they said they were thinking about honoring honoring uh, the legacy of someone of the ilk of Barry Black, our U.S. Senate chaplain. Uh, but as the committee got together, they began to think about who they could could uh, maybe honor and kind of lift up as a person that has influence. And so they chose me. That was really, I, I, I said, you know, if you put me up there, up there with that, I mean, uh, they really want to gas my head up, but I, I'm humble. I'm, I'm really humble to, to have, to have, uh, to have the honor of, of being chosen as that and that my 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 church would do so uh richard what you what you probably know is is that it's always uh, a, a one of the biggest honors is to be honored from home so pine yeah. forge when i was honored from pine forge that was bigger than all the other that all the other stuff and so this is also a a wonderful honor to uh, be highlighted by my uh, church congregation you better believe it. It is it is doubly honoring whenever you're invited back to receive um, some kind of tangible word of affirmation, um, and even more so when you're called back to speak, um, having been invited back to my home church. And I would hear others say that there's no place like home, and you kind of know that in theory. But I think once you kind of get on the road of your specific vocation, and then you're called back, and you kind of see. I often say you see people who you always thought were old, but now they're really old. Like yeah. they're actually <laughs> old now. When you were a child, you know they might have been in their late forties, early fifties. But now, my my one of my first uh, children's choir directors, I came back to speak. I think this was twenty eighteen, mm -hmm. and she says, "Richard, I'm so proud of you." She said, "Richard, I'll be eighty one soon." I said, "Eighty one? Like in my Ooh, mind, yeah. you were a little older back then, but they really weren't, and they invested so much of their own story in us." When I was growing up, my parents always told me that I had no choice but to go to Oakwood College. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, my first time stepping foot on campus was for college days as a senior at Pine Forge. So I just heard of the institution growing up. So my road to Oakwood was not, you know, HBCU pride, not because there was an absence of that in my church. It was just you're going because we said you're going. And I went to a, a state conference. And what that means is a state conference school, rather. What that means is um, it wasn't the, the population of my school from second grade to 10th grade was not predominantly black. So my first introduction yeah. to a predominantly black, historically black institution was Pine Forge, uh, which I'm glad I went to first before I went to Oakwood, because that would have really been culture shock. Um, <laughs> but then when I got to Oakwood, you know, that was the track there. I only referenced that first part to say, all of my friends were going to go to say a Forest Lake Academy in Florida, which is again, not predominantly black, probably a little bit more diverse than my school. And then to Southern Adventist University. So that was kind of the feeder track. I wanna right. go there, that's where my friends are going. And my dad was like, brother, you know, you can say as much as you want, you're going to Oakwood. <laughs> Once I arrived at Oakwood, oh man, you know, that's when the HBCU experience really began to 
I guess, get down into my veins and I began to become more aware of the history um, of HBCUs in our nation. That's a little bit of my journey. What about for you? You are a proud HBCU advocate. Yes. What has led to that and what has sustained that? Yes, so I, I want to actually go back to Pine Forge because there's a legacy of my family at Pine Forge and, and in that my, my mother uh, was similar to you in going for two years. Okay. And so she was committed, uh, committed to me having the uh, four year experience. So getting that total, that total experience that she wished she had had. Sure. Uh, I would also say that we were in a different time period going back to my church because uh, we had a culture in which uh, church school was the option, right? We had kind of, it was kind of that thing. How can we get as many as of our kids access to uh, Christian education? That was a big thing within our church. Hmm. And so it just happened to be around that time where I, I believe that my mother's generation probably was kind of the last generation that had that deep kind of commitment where you would you would uh, sacrifice your home and move into a smaller place and those kinds of things to give your children access to Christian education with that kind of dedication. So I want to um, I want to give a shout out to my parents for for their commitment uh, to that. Well, uh, if you said that you went to college days, I did not go to college days, even though I went to Pine Forge. And so uh, I didn't uh, make it to college days. Uh, and I did not, I, I wanted to get away from going to necessarily Oakwood. That wasn't going to be the place I was going to go. I was wanted to go somewhere different, right? Right. right. And so, um, uh, but I had others that encouraged me go to Oakwood for one year. You got that that one year, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I I graduated. I, th to be honest with you, I graduated from Pine Forge with a two point three. So I probably was in the lower third, or if not, kind of on the 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 bottom end of sure. those who are graduating. So that kind of limited my options of where I could go. Mm -hmm. And Oakwood was the institution that afforded me an opportunity to to go to college. And so the first the first time I stepped on campus was when I was registering, regis wow. registering for school. Wow. Uh, and so uh, why I am a advocate for HBCUs, because I, I believe that if done right, that they can be a site for liberation and decolonization. Wow. And so uh, particularly around uh, our minds, right? Getting our minds right around uh, impacting positively our community. Uh, and I would also say that uh, I'm not just an advocate of, of Black high school, historically Black uh, boarding academies like Pine Forge or uh, historically Black colleges and universities like Oakwood, uh, but I am, I am big on... Um, Black institution building okay. and leading to sovereign Black organizations uh, that are owned and operated and led by us. So I have a kind of a broader uh, thinking around Black institution building uh, as uh, in the context of, of decolonization and liberation of our people. Okay. I'm recently, I've recently been introduced to the term and concept of sovereignty. And I think you kind of gave a, a, um, a working definition and correct me if I'm wrong, is this the idea that when you're talking about building black institutions, sovereignty implies a level of autonomy of ownership? Am I correct in that? Are there more tangents that stem from that? No, that's essentially it that we that we as black people, although we can we can interact with other entities that our focus is on building our own institutions. One of the one of the things I've been talking about recently is Martin Luther King's uh, statement, uh, "Close to Death," where he said essentially that uh, he was afraid that he led us into a burning house, uh, metaphorically saying that uh, the focus was on integration, but there wasn't a, necessarily an economic plan okay. for us, and that uh, people, when when we allowed 
when when we only push for integration, mm -hmm. what we did not necessarily do is focus on uh, social justice and equity. So they brought us to the table, but we're at the the lower end of the table. And so how did we how do we get to equity? Uh, and what we found over the years is that there are some white people that are not interested in us being uh, treated with um, with fairness and yeah. and with equity. And so uh, we're going back. We're actually going back to where we were in the 50s and 60s, where we're building our own institutions sure. and uh, supporting our own uh, vision for our, our people moving forward. While at Oakwood, who were the leaders, whether administrative, faculty, or even student leaders that were influential on in your life? And kind of just mm. describe for us what your leadership journey was there. I know I kind of hinted at a certain leadership initiative that you were integral in spearheading, but there was some development that took place while you were there. How did your leadership flourish? Well, I would say this. One of the great things about Pine Forge and Oakwood were were that they gave you leadership experiences, right? Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I've actually found really challenging was that when I left uh, left black environments, I had less times to speak publicly, right? Yeah. Get up in front. When we were at Pine Forge, you led in worship every night, uh, uh, every night in some kinds of, uh, you know, yeah, fashion, right? Yeah. And then when you're at at Oakwood, uh, you don't have this opportunity at a University of Idaho or Auburn where I where I went to school. Mm -hmm. Every week, every week I was up in front of over a thousand people <laughs> in some way. Whether if I'm singing with the Aeolians yeah. or if I'm doing song service uh, for a Y or I'm singing at the at the university church you are in front of large audiences and things like that. Yeah. And so at larger institutions, you have opportunities to speak, but it's on a probably a smaller, on a smaller scale. And right. so, and so Oakwood probably, uh, what Oakwood did was provide, provide me with that type of platform. Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't, so as, as it relates to, to leadership, I always, I like to acknowledge uh, Delbert Baker as as someone key to my development, and in that he allowed me to shadow him in my my senior year and exposed me to a higher education leadership as a field of study, but even more so, so as a profession. And so, what was nice was that uh, by shadowing him, I I I. Uh, I learned that I could possibly become a president and what those steps may be. Sure. And from there, I did my own investigation and found out that I could get a degree in higher education administration. And so then I pursued that. But going back to the group that I started, I started this organization called the Progressive Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And this actually came about after I had run for student body vice, vice president and lost. I lost to uh, a, a, a friend of ours that, that you probably uh, would know, Joshua Nelson, Pastor Joshua Nelson. He won, he won the uh, vice president uh, election for our student government. But I was still passionate about the agenda uh, that I had and wanted to create a, uh, a, a, uh, a format that we could get that still move forward with some of those agenda points. And mm -hmm. a lot of it was around making people aware of issues that were affecting the black community outside of the campus. So right. on the campus, but also outside of the campus. And so uh, there were three initiatives that uh, I, I like to uh, take pride in. So one was a distinguished lecture series. Mm -hmm. uh, we had about five individuals come in uh, from business and industry to talk to our students. So I, I, whenever I see a lecture series at Oakwood University, I was, I, I, to my knowledge, we had the first lecture series on campus in the history of Oakwood. So uh, I take pride in, in starting that trend. There was something called the President's Fitness Challenge. At the time, uh, President uh, Baker, there was, there was a perceived disconnect between the administration and the students. And so 
he was at the time doing a lot of marathons. And so he would run, he would, you know, do a lot of running and things like that. And so what we did was uh, I partnered with his office to on, I believe it was on Tuesdays that when he would run that instead of running in his neighborhood, he would run on campus. And it's so what would happen is students would be able to interact with him in an informal way. Uh, And so we had a lot of like, uh, a lot of conversations while we were running, uh, doing something that he enjoyed, but it also uh, got our our black students thinking about fitness, right? Ooh, and so, uh, it also led to on on the Sundays of Alumni Weekend, we actually raised money uh, doing the President's Fitness Challenge, right? So you had wow. alumni come and run, so that ended up helping with student scholarships. And then lastly, uh, you mentioned something about a room in on the sec- or second or third floor of the library. Uh, that was uh, that was called the Talented 10th Incubator. Yeah. The idea around that was that we wanted young people to be ex- inspired, uh, inspired by alumni and others that had done wonderful work, uh, a wonderful work on behalf of the black community sure. and we had a space where they could study and and interact with within that uh within that environment so those were three things that we did uh under my administration as president of the president well excuse me the progressive black caucus yeah when you go to a place like oakwood and although i do believe that oakwood is uniquely special i don't think that it's the only place in which people can be inspired uh, towards a sense of purpose and calling. Oakwood being a part of my experience, I'll limit my comments to that space. When you go to a place like Oakwood, the seeds of influence come and are planted from all around. I mean, when you just walk in, you see posted placards that highlight what the campus and the grounds used to be. Walking up towards the administration building, seeing a photo of Dred Scott, and a brief little historical synopsis of his case and what that meant. Um, Getting a sense of the story that that is interwoven between the towering oaks that stand on the campus. Um, You see the names on, you know, Ashby Auditorium, Eva B. Dykes Library, Cooper Complex, Mosley Complex, and, you know, Anna, not who are these people? And then you get more story when you get to know who these people were, not just in the faith community, uh, that is Seventh-day Adventism, but in terms of how Oakwood and persons who have been a part of the Oakwood story are permanently etched into the fabric of American history. I mean, we are in the deep South, as it were, in Alabama. Yeah. A mm-hmm. little story in 2008 when President Barack Obama was elected. I mean, it was just rejoicing, right? And again, yeah. we're talking about what you knew and what you didn't know. I knew we were in school in Alabama. That was, you know, no duh. But it, it didn't dawn on me until my mother called me, we rejoicing, we rejoicing. She said, son, don't leave campus. I said, mom, what are you talking about? Don't leave campus. She says, you're in Alabama. <laughs> Not everyone is happy about this event. And I said, mom, yeah. it's 2008. But she was coming from a different perspective. She's like, yeah, I know yeah. it's 2008, but you'd be surprised at how the lines are blurred when something like this happens. So, so my yeah. point is, when you look at Black history and you see where Oakwood is positioned, so much inspiration comes. I remember third floor, you're right. I remember going up there and seeing the incubator room. I remember hearing about student leaders. So I'm thankful that it wasn't just those like a Frank Hill, a Barry Black, um, like your Angela Browns and so many persons, but just a few years ahead of me, the likes of yourself and others, I was saying, man, something happens when you go through here, you catch something, you get a sense of hey, not only I can be, but I, I am someone and I can use influence now. That influence now goes with you beyond Oakwood. You studied, uh, you, you received your degree rather in interdisciplinary studies. Mm-hmm. Give me the three concentrations again. Music, business, and communications. And after that, what was what was next for you when you left Oakwood? Did you have a clear vision or did someone or someone's come along and kind of help you shape what was next? Uh, so I knew that I wanted to work in higher education. And so uh, because I was a student activist, I wanted to work in student affairs. And so uh, I had established Alabama residency by the time, by my fourth year, 
okay. there at Oakwood. And so I applied to University of Alabama and to Auburn University and Auburn accepted me. And so uh, I graduated on a Saturday night. Uh, my godfather, I, I'll take this moment right here. My godfather uh, uh, and, my, and my godmother were the ones who helped to move me into my first apartment uh, my first apartment there at, at Auburn. Wow. Uh, and it was a seminal moment in my, and, and important moment in my life. Uh, there were, there was one individual that essentially went to school with me from, from first grade until Oakwood. Mm -hmm. And so it, when I went to Auburn, that was the shift of me at not having any comfort of knowing people around me, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so when I went to Oakwood, that wasn't any kind of, I was crying or anything mm -hmm. like that because, you know, I, I still, I felt like I people. Pine, Four, I saw, I, Pine Forest had a table. They yeah, had yeah, a table yeah. where we were so with, <laughs> but, but when I went to Auburn, that wasn't like that. They mm -hmm. dropped me off and I cried like a baby. <laughs> I cried. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, and so I, I, I mentioned them uh, and I'll say his name, Eddie Jones, uh, mm. Eddie mm. Jones, Jr. Uh, he passed away this past Wednesday. Oh man. Uh, and so uh, mm. he was a, a, someone that really uh, impacted my, impacted my life. And um, that was one of those important moments mm -hmm. for, uh, for my godmother and my godfather to, to uh, uh be there in the gap for even my my parents who weren't able to drop me off yeah. and uh uh to start that graduate school experience they were a part of that process and so one of the things i, I will say is that i have a strong village i have i've had a strong village and so what so a lot of times when i i talk about my godparents and, and my 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 wife was like man you have a lot of godparents, but I have, uh, and when I say godparents, they were like really yeah. a part of my life. Like they weren't, it wasn't like, oh, there's this guy, you know, you got godparents somewhere. No, yeah. they really <laughs> invested and poured and, and yeah. poured into me. And so uh, I thought that was, that was really important to uh, I, another part of my, my development uh, was that village, that village of others uh, that weren't necessarily in the church or those kinds of things, but just loved and poured into me. Yeah, man. Um, my condolences, because you're right. When you have your village who, who track with you through the seasons of development, it is a, it is a sense of pride for them because they've seen the journey. And we're, we're not old men. We are older than we were. We're young. But we, we're yeah. old enough to see peers and their children developing. I just had the chance to be a part yeah. of a kind of rites of passage for one of our mutual friends. His eldest turned 13. And he Whoa. said, can you? <laughs> right, right. That's what I said. We're not, we're not old, but we got, we're, we're old enough to have, friends, have teenagers, right? Right. And I remember literally the first time I held this baby. And here he is 13. And I'm on his rites of passage community of men and we're pouring into him wow. and I can only imagine I mean that just kind of gave me a taste of what others see when they see me they say man Rich was so proud of you and yeah. it's because they've seen me develop I had the chance to talk to my uncle my dad's youngest brother a couple of weeks ago and I said uncle man do you remember when I was born he was like of course like yeah and that was like wow like you literally have my whole life as a memorable volume I don't even remember my whole life. Like at a certain yeah, point, right, my, right, memory, right, right. <laughs> my memory starts to pick up, but, but you see me through it all. And so um, just a huge shout out to the Jones family for their investment. Yeah. Um, I, I was right there with you on location in my mind, man. Those are tears worth pouring out because yeah. it's a moment of transition, right? Yes. All that has come behind us and the unknown variables of the future. And the pieces begin to come together. It's funny. It might sound funny, man. Facebook, uh, people feel different ways about Facebook, but Facebook does help you in your catalog of memory. I remember the pictures posted from your graduation ceremony on Facebook when you finished yeah. uh, your PhD. And it was yet yeah. another moment of inspiration to say, oh, man, like, 
you know how you were saying you thought that um you thought that man it just left me but you were making a point previously that you thought that something was only reserved for older people mm-hmm. but that you feel you realize oh man young people can be involved as well well that was it for me i thought when i heard the term phd like you you only achieve your phd like after 50 or something like that yeah like you had to live a lot of life and then somehow you were granted access into this space so you were one of the first young persons in general that made me aware like oh wow it's possible to continue pursuing academic scholarship and excellence not to mention the robe you were wearing was bad <laughs> uh, if i could jump in really really quick on that so uh, I actually, uh, a part of this story that I uh, that I did not complete was I graduated on a Saturday night. Mm. They dropped me. They dropped me off uh, at Auburn on Monday on uh, Monday afternoon. Wow! And then I started classes that Thursday and never stopped. Wow! I never stopped until I turned twenty six and earn, uh, earn my PhD at that, at that age. And so I went straight through, there were no summers off. There were no, uh, there was none of that. Right. We just, we just got it. We just went in and got it done. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's possible. It's, it's possible to, to do. I didn't know what a graduate assistantship was and that, <laughs> that there were opportunities for funding for graduate students. I had no knowledge of that. Uh, God, uh, ordered my steps in such a way that he gave me favor with different people and, yeah. and they started uh, coaching me and telling me how to kind of navigate uh, the graduate school experience. And so uh, that was a blessing. That was a blessing to, um, uh, to uh, be funded, uh, to be funded throughout my graduate school experience. Now we have the benefit of having collegiate experience in our, in our background. Um, I'm in a doctoral program now completing um, at Boston University. You are now in a teaching administrative post at University of Idaho. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who are presently kind of pushing back against the entire educational system as it's set up. Um, Mm -hmm. They might cite a number of persons, and this is this is admirable, a number of persons who, you know, didn't go to school or dropped out of school and now they uh, are millionaires, or if not millionaires, it is very successful doing life well. And they'll say, you know, see, you don't need to go to college. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? Is collegiate education still a viable option, um, specifically for young black uh, men and women, and anybody by extension? What are your thoughts on that? Do you think so? Is it still necessary? Or do you kind of hear what people are saying when they push back? I, I definitely, I, I think it's, uh, education is, is valuable. Uh, and I think it's a primary way for people to move up the class structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, but education is not the only way to move up the move up through, uh, and find, uh, social mobility, right. But I believe it's the primary way, uh, in this country, uh, to do that. Uh, but I don't just look at education from the standpoint of being able to get a job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or to make money, because uh, I would hope that it helps you to be to think as a global citizen. I would hope wow. that you would interact. Your learning is not just it's not just based on being in a classroom. It's interacting with people from all around the world. Those are the kinds of things that are the intangibles of of being a part of a classroom. Okay. Uh, and so can you be successful outside of going to going to going through a formal educational process? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but the majority of people uh, have to make some type of investment, collegiate investment to uh, move up the class structure in this country. That's just how it is. And mm-hmm. in particular, uh, black black people. Right. And, and so I think the investment generally is well worth it, but I think we have to be very uh, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful about how we think about student loans yeah. and kind of navigating that, 
navigating uh, that process. Uh, but here's the thing that I say. So I have student, I, as Dr. Freeman, my, my wife has happens to have her doctorate. Um, and so we have student loan, we have student loan debt and it's gonna still take, some, or take, take us some time to do that. Uh, but what people don't understand is that if we wanna buy a house and things like that, we still are because of uh, the salaries that we make, the class standing that we have, all those things, I'm still uh, able to do some things that maybe maybe others may not be able to do. And so there's kind of, sometimes there's a, a trade-off because um, our families may not have the money to uh, send us to school, uh, school and we be debt-free after we get out. And there's some people that want, they're so scared of debt that, that they won't make that investment. Yeah. So I think there's all, there's always this balance of, of strategic investments in your future that allow you mm. to do the things that you feel mm. that uh, you're called to do. That's real. That's real. Thank you. Thank you. So recently I read articles by Maximilian Alvarez and Corey Miles writing for the Chronicle, uh, commenting on Harvard University's rejection of renowned Dr. Cornell West, his application for tenure, his tenure consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna explore that with you a bit. Um, yeah. What is tenure? For those yeah. who might know the term, but don't know the substance of it. And yeah. why are segments of the higher education community underscoring this incident as kind of symptomatic of a, of a larger crisis? Yes, so tenure is a process uh, that individuals go through for five to seven years of observation uh, regarding their teaching ability, their research ability, and their service and outreach uh, to both their institution and to the broader uh, community. Okay. And so uh, there are various checkpoints in between. So each year, just like and probably in most jobs, there is a annual evaluation. Mm -hmm. But in your third year as a professor, uh, there is, it's a special, uh, a special point in, in um, looking at your development as a, a faculty member. Mm -hmm. And what you do is your peers, your peers that work in, within your department, make a uh, observation and recommendation with regards to uh, your development so far as a instructor, if they're seeing a strong, uh, uh, where they're seeing strong advancements over that time, they will recommend that you continue to move forward in the process uh, to gain tenure. Sure. If not, if not, they will say, here are some serious areas in which you need to work on. And if it's deemed by administration once looking at your uh, at your resume, what we call curriculum vitae, that you are not progressing as you should, there may be a recommendation that you, in a little while, possibly seek other employment because mm -hmm. you're not meeting the standards of your discipline and the institution. But let's say that you that you're doing well, right? You have another three to four years uh, to meet the standards of your discipline and your institution to gain tenure. Tenure is what I, what I think is a process that, uh, that says that um, if uh, once you get this designation, you are, you are now, if we were, were to ever want to, an institution wanted to fire you, mm -hmm. they would have to go through a due process, right? So you're not at will, right? right. So right. they would have the, it would be on the institution to prove your negligence. Mm. It would not be on you. It would not be necessarily on you to have to prove that because you've gone through a process, a rigorous process to show that you are an expert in your field and that you're competent at what you're, what you're doing. And so often we like to say that it's equivalent to um, what we see in minister in the ministerial 
realm, uh, the equivalent of ordination, right? Yeah. So there is a observation period in which uh, senior ministers observe uh, ministers that are junior in the field. And after that certain period, there's a recommendation uh, for them to be ordained. Right. And uh, so, so if they were to let someone go, generally a, a minister go, it would be probably, you know, the last ones hired, right? Uh, and so similar uh, in the educational realm, if you don't have tenure, uh, tenure, generally you would be the ones, uh, you would be the individuals that would be uh, let go first. Okay. Now, thank you because I, I, I know the term tenure and I generally had an idea that it had something to do with security um, mm -hmm. as a part of it, but I thank you for expounding upon it. And oh, excuse, excuse me. I want to I want to add that uh, where tenure uh, now I'm going into my my professor hat, right? But uh, a part of where it derived from was when uh, you have major funders, you have you have legislators and others that. Um, that have opinions about the university and various various issues, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say I have, so let's say I, I'm a, what we call a higher educationist, someone who studies higher education. Sure. So let's say I criticize some of the decisions around higher education in my state, mm -hmm. right? If I did not have tenure, you could have state legislature uh, legislators say that you should fire Sidney Freeman because wow. he's criticizing he's criticizing what the decisions that we're making and he's doing whatever. But I can stand on my expertise and say and say I'm saying this because of my expertise, and I'm not just saying this sure. willy nilly. And my tenure protects me from outside influences just coming in and saying. Um, you know, I didn't like what you know. I didn't like what Sidney Freeman said about this particular issue, and he should be fired, right? Mm -hmm. So I would hope that would be the same thing uh, with ministry, in the sense that if uh, just because you preach something that someone didn't like, right? They would have yeah. the conference would have to talk with you and say, "Let's talk this through." Right. Versus if you're early on in your career, it's like this is how you preach, this is how you do this. If you don't, then then this ain't the place for you, right? Sure. So that's kind of the that's kind of the thought process be, uh, be, uh, behind it. So we, we have this term called academic freedom. Uh, part mm. of that is to say that as a as a professor or an academic, you have a more latitude because you are the expert in your field and you are doing and you know some of the cutting edge things that are being talked about in your field and actually conducting that research. Sure. And so you're applying that to your sphere of, of where you teach and also where you have influence. So you know, I've talked before about your journey toward tenure mm -hmm. um, and you were not flying by the seat of your pants by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you were investing in addition to your teaching responsibilities now. All right, mm -hmm. I just want to underscore for those who are familiar and may not be familiar with the process, mm -hmm. in addition to your professional responsibilities and your family responsibilities, you were pursuing certifications, you were writing, mm -hmm. publishing, partnering, okay? So you know by personal experience the, the inherent developmental challenge of this. I mean, just production-wise, yeah. you have to produce, right? right? Now, on top of that, there are, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, in a perfect world or in a perfect nation or in a perfect system, mm -hmm. you know, production would equal credibility. But we know right. that with everything, there are obstacles, man, that come. Mm -hmm. Describe if you would, so let me just ask it like this, man. Did you encounter obstacles? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I, I, I had it at, at my third year review um my third year review i was i had done well i had more more publications than people that were were my supervisors and things mm. like that uh but there were individuals that were upset upset that i was hired 
that I was hired at the rank I was hired, right? right. And I made the money that I made. And a part of that, uh, how they knew those kinds of things were because I worked for a public institution. Sure. And so because I work for a public institution, my salary is posted, uh, my rank is posted. And, and so I think people, white people were comfortable. They were happy and comfortable when I was, when they thought I was coming in at a lower rank. Yeah. And, but when they learned that I came in at a higher rank equal to them, number one, and number two, I made more money coming in than they did. And they had been at the institution longer. There was, there were challenges around, around that. So there are politics that, wow. that play out in that, in that process. And I, 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 I mentioned, I, I mentioned ministry because I know that's your vocation, but I'm sure, I'm sure those, those kinds of things play themselves out too. So if a, if a past, if a younger pastor gets a, a larger church earlier on and perceive earlier on in their ministry, the equivalent of that is kind of rank and certain classes you're able to teach and, um, mm -hmm. uh, access. There were people that were mad that I served on uh, editorial boards that I did. And they were saying, how did he do this at this point in his career? And I've been in this thing for, you know, over 25 years and haven't had that opportunity. So you have these kinds of things that play out, uh, particularly when this is, even though you know the individuals that are reviewing you, it's a anonymous process in and that um, they do this beyond, they, they do it beyond a veil of the committee made this decision. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot of pot shots that are, yeah. are made in yeah. the process that it's like, if you got a problem with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's just, you know, like, like what's, what's up yeah. now that, uh, so that's kind of the, I call it the whiteness of the process. Right. Cool. So they're not going to be straight up. So, uh, yeah, so I had challenges both, uh, so I had challenges in my my tenure, uh, my third year review process and in my tenure process. Uh, uh, what happened was it it leaked out that I was in the tenure process. You have individuals outside of your institution are requested to evaluate your work uh, because it's another form of of getting credible data on it. So uh, you may, there's sometimes you, you don't have a lot of people at your institution that have your same expertise. So for instance, I'm the only higher educationist at my institution, trained person that studies higher education. Sure. So what they do is they lean more on my external reviewer. So they get people that that study the same thing I do. And they say to them, oh, his research is sound based on, the best practices in my field. Well, uh, it leaked out that the uh, that people that did the same work at Harvard were uh, one of the individuals at Harvard that uh, was a higher educationist like me was one of the individuals that evaluated my work, and so my institution is not even in the, the sphere of that institution in the sense of resources, right? So we don't have the same type of resources. And they asked the question, would I get tenure at Harvard? Wow. Which was unfair, right? right. So you have all these kinds of, so these are the kinds of issues that, uh, that black faculty, black faculty had. So uh, in the case of Cornell West, right? Your direct question around Cornell West, his issue is more of, this is more uh, emblematic or, yeah, more emblematic of, you know, a broader issue. He's sure. he's 67 right now. So he's retirement eligible. Right. This was, this is not about him needing tenure. He doesn't need tenure, right? He can, he makes enough money if he just left the academy and just was speaking and yeah, all of that kind of sure. stuff, right? It was a, a sign. It's a, a sign of disrespect, and it's and it's a and what it does is just like when Skip Gates. Remember when Skip Gates was arrested outside of his home, right? Um, uh, uh, in that in that community, 
it sent it sent a signal to all other black people, right? Mm -hmm. That it didn't matter that you were Skip Gates and you were endowed professor with an endowed professor means that uh, you have a a rank of of a professorship where people actually fund your position externally. Sure. So in addition to to your your position being funded by your institution, they they drop a little extra money on it right. externally uh, to sweeten the pot. So he has high visibility and has resources that if he can be disrespected, that means anybody can be disrespected, can. any of us. And so what we what we're seeing now again from the Harvard community is that uh, by not giving Cornell West uh, a transformational figure. In, in education, period. He's right. not just, it's not even just in religion or black studies or social, like he crosses all of those and has transformed those disciplines. Right. To say, I mean, most professors at Harvard haven't, haven't transformed their discipline. So <laughs> it's, a show, it's a sign of, of disrespect. So I think why it's bec become public is because it's not about, him actually needing tenure, it's about disrespect. And so I, I think what we actually are seeing is a backlash. There is a, a, actually a, a, a backlash to the progress, the progress that's being made around um, a diversity since this new election that has happened. Sure. So sure. there is, so there's a more liberal backlash where where it's where we think that higher education is a little more liberal than than uh, other spaces, but mm -hmm. there is this kind of push. There's this kind of pushback um, at at various institutions at various institutions, and they happen like this. Yeah, yeah, I, and I appreciate the context and the background, not only of the tenure track, but also just situating him. That is Dr. West in terms of his place in his career, 67 years old. I remember, in fact, I had the opportunity, shout out to uh, the then religious vice, Pastor Marquise Johns. He invited me to be a part of the platform participants who were there to receive Dr. Cornell West when he came in, actually a part of a lectureship, spoke at Oakwood uh, University. And just a phenomenal experience from his time entering the office to us yeah. coming out on stage to him presenting to sitting with the students and signing books all of it was just like wow and since then I've come again to know more and more of what a moment that was and so when I heard of the rumblings and saw on social media and other academic journals talking about it from various perspectives um, what little I know about the higher education space in terms of uh, my own experience I knew enough about Dr. West to know there has to be something more to this. I mean, I don't think anybody was sitting on the review saying, now he's missing an article. You know, like, <laughs> come on right, now, right, his right, right, body right, right. of work speaks for itself, but you've been able to situate it in its uh, institutional context, in its uh, field, the context of higher education in general, but also the political ramifications, implications rather of it all. And it's important, I think, for us. Now, now again, let's be clear. Dr. Cornell West in this particular situation is one of many. There are scores of black scholastics who could share their stories about what they are experiencing right now. I think your right. point is, is, is very, um, it is well received that, that if such as a Cornell West, you know, if there's such boldness to say no to him, then I think it just speaks to, as you said, the you know, go ahead, go ahead, get in, get in. The president hasn't even, to my to to my knowledge, the president hasn't even responded yet mm. to this whole issue. So there, so there is a someone of his stature. Yeah, would the generally at any institution would demand a conversation. Yeah, right. And so what it's saying is it's putting it's putting us back in our place, mm -hmm. right? Who does who does Cornell who does Cornell think he is right uh and so it's something is something that higher education is going to have to deal with uh I, there's a broader there's an even broader conversation about how black faculty and staff are being treated uh uh in relationship to our students 
So here is the calculus that that we're starting to see. Um, and and there's been a lot of conversations of uh, conversations about this. So white institutions are are doing a lot of it, are creating a lot of initiatives to attract black students. Mm -hmm. uh, before it was we would just concentrate on black student athletes. Now because there's uh, less students, uh, there are a small a smaller number of students going to college just because of birth rates and things like that. Right. Um, so they're trying to they're trying to attract more students of color more broadly, and I'm I'm talking about black students more specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, they're putting things in place to uh, attract these black students, but essentially they're saying we're saying well, black faculty and staff are employees, so if uh, if they're not uh, if they're not feeling supported or whatever, they can leave. Yeah, they're, we're disposable. We're disposable. And, uh, but we want your students, but what they're not seeing, I, I've, I've been paralleling it to uh, the work in K-12 education, mm -hmm. whereas in urban settings where there's often this, uh, this idea, well, we'll help the, the, if we're trying to change the community, we'll work with the child, uh, forget the parents, mm -hmm. uh, forget, forget that generation, we'll just concentrate on the child. Well, we're seeing that that, that's a a uh, full uh, a a a the wrong approach. Let me say it that way. So that's the wrong approach. You have to work also with the parents. So the parents are, are not feeling like uh, you care about them. Then that impacts that impacts the child. Yeah. So if you want to retain black students, right, and you want to retain and graduate black students, then you need black faculty and staff. Right. And so that's kind of the, I, I believe was kind of the next frontier. And these are the kinds of things that when we see what Cornell West happening, uh, we're saying, wow, I even though um, he's at a prestigious institution and he doesn't need he doesn't need tenure and things like that. It just is, uh, you know, it's just a signal to us that they don't care about us. Man, what keeps you inspired then when these realities are still happening to such as a Cornell West? And here you are um, well on the road of your own journey. What keeps you inspired to continue producing, to continue teaching, to continue pouring into the upcoming generation? The the upcoming generation, right? So, I mean, that's that's where you gain inspiration. I, I, it's been interesting when you when you mentioned my brother and even my sister, there's uh, something unique about us. We are from three different generations. And so mm -hmm. I'm the oldest, but my brother is seven years younger than I am. And then my sister is another seven years younger than him. Wow. And and but uh, in some of my recent articles that I've written, uh, I, I say that my work is a love letter to them. And so mm -hmm. essentially, uh, yeah. at every stage that I have developed, I, I, I've, you know, that I've developed, I have written an article about what I learned at that stage, right? And so essentially is they don't have to become professors, but here are things, here are some principles that I've learned uh, over time that I would love to share uh, with my with my siblings if they need that if, if they were to need it right. uh, but also it's open to a broader community from from the for those to learn from my uh, experiences when you're not teaching reading writing um, when you are not pushing forward um, community um, objectives man just in terms of your own personal self-care uh what do you do man what does dr sydney freeman do to just kind of chill recover what are some of your hobbies netflix and chill um <laughs> one of the things that uh i've really been enjoying is is uh, watching international movies okay. and so don't ask me what specific movies but uh but nigerian or mm -hmm. south african movies uh indian movies mexican shows mm -hmm. those kinds of things uh, have been great. So I've I've uh, had the privilege of doing a lot of a lot of traveling. I've um, I had the opportunity of speaking at o Oxford University. I've spoken in uh, Vietnam and mm -hmm. in uh, Israel, Jerusalem, or 
yeah, Jerusalem, Israel, uh, and other places. And so I, I love international, I love international travel. Mm -hmm. uh, love spend, just the big thing is I just love spending time with my wife. If we, if we're together, that's that's the place to be. Forget everything else. That's where, yeah. that's where, that's where I want to be. <laughs> yeah, our wives are um the best of friends, and so in addition to our uh, shared societal um passions uh, we are blessed brother to be married to brilliant and beautiful black woman inside yeah. and out um and, yeah. and i'm not just saying that we are genuinely blessed we had the chance to break bread together uh last year in georgia yeah four of us so man you know of course those who know you know you for those who don't they've got to know you for a significant amount of time in our conversation but i must get this part in man it's not all about you and it's not all about me, man. We have wives who yeah. have their own thing. They are brilliant. Like I said, they have initiatives, passion projects. They are professionals. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, man, why do you support your wife's dreams? Why is it that, man, I'm not just getting degrees. I'm not just doing me. Why do you invest in her? Uh, because she's a child of God. And I want to, to for all of us to be able to fulfill our dreams, uh, but also she has sacrificed for me. Like one of the things that I did not fully appreciate and understand that, that every woman wouldn't have uh, moved to Moscow, Idaho <laughs> and made that, made that sacrifice, right? Uh, so to give you context of Moscow, Idaho, this is the biggest, biggest uh, town in our, in, in our part of the state. And it is, uh, less than 25,000 people. So we're the big, we're the big city, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, we're excited because we're getting, we're getting a target. We're getting yes, a target. <laughs> uh, we don't have, we, we don't, we're so small. We don't even have a, uh, Burger King. So, yeah. so, so for her to make this, uh, make this sacrifice and, 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 uh, travel life, uh, tr travel life and have this adventure with me, uh, has been a wonderful thing. And I believe she third, she de deserves the world, man. She yeah. deserves, she de deserves the world. And so I, I can't wait to this pandemic, uh, subsides because, uh, there's more traveling to be done, taking her mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, we've been to all 50 States. All right, uh, yes, we've, sir. we've made, we've, we've made, we've made that happen. And so looking forward now to uh, my goal is for us as as a family to see see uh, the world almost as we see see the country that the world is ours and, and not just be so U.S. centric. But right. we want to know we we want to we want to go to South Africa and Bermuda and and uh and India and other places. That's kind of the uh, that's kind of my goal. My mm -hmm. goal that I would love to see for our family to uh, to be able to do. Yeah, man. You all traveled across uh, the states, really, uh, going mm -hmm. from Idaho to Georgia, and mm -hmm. uh, you shared a bit of what that was like. You know, what was that like? <laughs> that was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, it was an interesting. It was an interesting time. Uh, when we left, when we left, it was, um, I think we left in, left at the end of May, mm -hmm. we left at the end of May. So it was during the pandemic. It was during the pandemic. So we had to put uh, pieces in place. Um, and so I will say this as I, I think this will be helpful kind of to your, your viewers is that we never stay in small towns. We always but make sure that we travel during the day mm -hmm. and that we, that we, uh, would stay in a city. Okay. Right. And, and so that's just for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, so we did that. So that was, that was in the end of May, the George Floyd situation popped up in early June, early June. Right. And so you had all those different things going on. And um, so we traveled, we, we traveled the Eastern coast to go see, to see the rest of my family. So we actually went to New Jersey, traveled to New Jersey uh, and then to Connecticut. Mm. And then we came back, then we came back down by that, by that time, uh, you had Black Lives Matter yeah. uh, uh, Plaza in, in DC. So we visited there 
And so we drove back across country during the height of what was going on with this Black Lives Matter stuff. So there was also a protocol we had to think about with yeah. regards to safety traveling across across country. And so on the way back, we were sure to, uh, we made sure to see, uh, uh, to go to a central high school in Little Rock, Arkansas, I had that experience. Uh, and then also uh, we, we went to Tulsa, Oklahoma and saw Black Wall Street in the height of Wow. of all that going all, all that was going on uh with these uh you know riots going on all those kinds of things going on so uh that was amazing that was kind of an amazing time to kind of travel across country uh and experience black wall street and see the names of those who uh whose businesses have been burned down and now reestablishing them creating museums yeah. uh, in that section of the town so it was a wonderful wonderful experience uh, i believe the 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 best states the best states are uh number one number one idaho number two montana number three hawaii really okay and i've okay. been to all 50 right, i've been right, to right. all 50 sure so so a part of Idaho and Montana, why they are so great is because they're untouched. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're untouched. They're wide open. So those are wonderful places. If you, if you have, th those are, uh, uh, hidden gems. These are hidden gems. I don't think they want us to visit anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're hidden gem. but they're, but they're hidden gems, uh, and, and lovely places. I'm coming just because of it. Knock, knock. You know, <laughs> I've never been to either of those. And I believe I am 36 out of 50, if I'm not mistaken, my last count. So got, got a few more to go. And that's a, that's the a goal of uh, Kyla and, and mine. My, uh, one of our goals as well to get to all 50. And um, we also don't only want to continue traveling internationally, but travel with our friends. So we got to plan yeah, yeah. an international foray and get out there and see well, the world. Well, I got to get to Bermuda. That's the thing. So what, one of my best friends is Ty Douglas. And yes, so, I, so I'm so i trying to, I, I need to check the, the family tree because there's such a connection <laughs> with Bermuda. I don't know what's, what's going on. Yeah, man, we need to find a way. I'm sure that you, you just, you hang in there. You're a few, you're closer <laughs> to the kingdom than you think. <laughs> <laughs> So what's next for you, man? What's next for Dr. Sidney Freeman? Yeah, so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is uh, what do I want to do next professionally? Mm -hmm. And a lot of my research has focused in the past on um, higher education issues because of my training. But what has been happening recently is uh, probably I would say in the last kind of four or five years is that uh, my interest has shifted more into the spiritual and religious realm. Okay. And so actually, I would like to kind of do more research related to black spirituality um, and black religion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have a ministry called the Liberation Movement okay. uh, that started last year based on a uh, a broadcast, I guess you can say, <laughs> and uh, it went uh, it 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 had a lot of views and things yeah. like that. And so, uh, I what's what's been challenging is that I've been doing higher education for for so long. It's almost like m moving a a large ship, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to kind of make that turn to make that term that right. turn because uh i've written i've written in my in my era of higher education over well close to a hundred articles and so there's a lot so there's and i'm known for that and i'm celebrated for that that kind of thing right but my goal within within i was hoping to do it this year but it's 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 still a little hard to do it but my goal within the next couple of years to make that shift uh and then um the the big thing that I find out within the next uh, next probably four weeks is that uh, if all things continue to go well, I would I'll be named the uh, the first African American uh, male professor to have earned uh, the rank of full professor at our flagship university, the University 
of Idaho. And wow. so uh, <laughs> my my wife, my wife uh, is up for promotion and uh, she will uh, will move into the rank of clinical associate professor. So we're, we're still waiting to hear kind of the final word on that within the next uh, next month. But generally, they let you know sometime in the month of, uh, of March. Mm. Uh, and so we'll be celebrating our, our, our 12 year anniversary on March 15th. Yes, sir. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to, to the month of March being a, a time of celebration. And uh, yeah, so we're looking at that. Uh, hopefully I can, uh, I also am thinking about what it would look like to be become an endowed professor like sure. someone like Cornell West and uh, maybe and maybe even having some kind of administrative role that would support uh, faculty of color. So those are things that I'm thinking about moving forward. When you get to kind of the full professor stage, that's kind of the pinnacle. Yeah. Uh, unless you get unless you get an endowed professorship, that's kind of that next thing. So uh, I'm kind of at that moment where I'm thinking about: Do I want to go and in, go back into administration, full time administration, mm -hmm. or uh, the faculty, uh, the faculty realm? Hey, listen. Well, in advance, congratulations, my brother. This okay. has been a long time coming and well deserved to you and to Linda. You, I don't know, maybe I. I I'll covet this. Uh, you heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> so, man, listen, as we kind of uh, prepare to tie, tie it all together, mm -hmm. if you had to state your philosophy or your sense of vocation and calling at this point in your life, how would you capture it? I would say that my calling, my calling is to focus on uh, helping to decolonize uh, black minds uh, to the point that we can move towards uh, liberation and sovereignty. So essentially that's the next frontier of what I believe God is calling uh, me to do. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Brother man, listen, this is a conversation that we could continue literally for another several hours. And I hope that you would uh, be so kind as to come back on the show and maybe we will oh, yes. have um, Dr. Freeman, that is Dr. Linda Freeman to come on as well. <laughs> if she hears this, when she hears it, I'm sure she's going to be shaking her head like, uh, uh, I don't know, brother, but we might have to you know, <laughs> get her on. Listen, for those who want to, and I would implore you and insist that you do so, continue to track with Dr. Sidney Freeman, continue to explore the good work that he is doing, not just in his capacity as a professor at the University of Idaho, but also as a thought leader on his own right, of his own right. I want you to go and check him out on Facebook and on YouTube, facebook.com, youtube.com backslash Sidney Freeman Jr. Also follow him and converse with him, engage with him on Twitter at Dr. Mm -hmm. SFJ. Also, mm -hmm. he's on Instagram, Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. And you can check out his website, Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. dot you see he's rocking the merch, Dr. Freeman, thought leader. <laughs> support, support, support. And listen, drop some comments down below. Let us know what your thoughts are, if you have any questions. If you've not done so already, please do us a favor. Subscribe to this so that you can continue to engage with us in conversations where we listen, learn, and live together. My brother, yeah. man, it's been a true pleasure. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so Welcome. much for this opportunity. You're welcome. And I hope the rest of your morning goes well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, so I won't be staying up late tonight. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, 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 you, and your your, you and your bed have a, a date that is soon to come. <laughs> Listen, friends, we hope and we hope and pray that you have been not only challenged, but inspired and even changed by this conversation. There are always a lot of things going on in our nation, and we're sure in your particular locale. But the good news is you are always able to make a life-changing contribution for those around you. Use your influence for good. Be able to be, remember to thank those who have been instrumental as a part of your village in shaping and making who you are today. You never know what steps God has ordered for you, and what's coming next. That's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. I've been your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. Until next time, continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live. <laughs>